start. Welcome everyone. Welcome to this session of uh, the 2011 Ideas Festival, the festival where we feed your mind and nourish your spirit. And uh, in this session, we're going to look at how the world, or the world of us, looks at uh, major catastrophes through the lens of the media. And we have with us uh, two special guests who have extensive experience firsthand in uh, using that media lens. Uh, Maria Spenson from uh, ABC News Radio, <laughs> uh, and Neil Malloy, the uh, editor in chief of our suburban newspapers here in Brisbane. Welcome, colleagues. Thanks, Rod. We're going to. Uh, have, uh, I guess, a, a sort of exploration in this session where you can be involved and you can comment, you can argue, you can contest, you can confront. But we're going to, we're, and, and before you do, you're going to put your phone on silent and in <laughs> flight mode, <laughs> uh, which is why I was holding this in the first place, to remind me, to remind you, just as well it uh, went off. Um, and uh, the topic that we're uh, canvassing around today is not the sort of age-old problem about, you know, um, does the media report things accurately, do they distort the truth, and that's the sort of stuff that ex-politicians <laughs> whinge about. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, you know, it is true that um, after a long period um, as a former politician, one could have a uh, somewhat jaundiced view of uh, how the media presents things, but what we really want to uh, explore today is not <coughs> what politicians think or indeed uh, what the political process involves in uh, media reporting, but what it means to us as members of the community uh, when we reflect on <coughs> how uh, major events, such as the recent floods in Queensland, uh, are covered by the, uh, by the media. In various ways. So to kick off, what I might do is uh, invite our guests one at a time, just to give, uh, first of all, a little bit of background to themselves, really, what their um, career trajectory has been, what brought you to the role you're in today, uh, before we then see whether that has any relevance to how you might uh, look at things like uh, the floods or major events. So. Um, Marius, would you like to go first? Yeah, briefly, I, I began where um, uh, Neil is now in uh, Rupert Murdoch's empire in the Daily Telegraph in Sydney, and uh, catastrophes of various kinds are visited on journos in reasonably frequent uh, occurrences. I can remember the Granville train disaster in Sydney and issues like that. Um, internationally, I was covering issues like uh, in South Africa, I was there through the, the first uh, democratic elections. And uh, the, the dynamics of that were in part a political story and in part a, you know, covering uh, a near war story. And I have covered uh, disasters such as the Rwanda uh, um, massacre in 94. Um, so I look back on a reasonably catastrophic uh, career from a distance. Right now I'm covering politics, which is catastrophic in its own quiet way. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting to, to look at um, how all of those things are reported um, over, over, what, um, four decades virtually that I've been doing it. And uh, much has changed in technical terms, but I don't think that much has changed as a central task. And I think journalists remain central to the task because um, there's a lot of information out. There's, always, there's more and more information out there, but information is not journalism. And you need someone to organise the information in a way and distill what is information and what is disinformation. And um, experienced journos are the best mechanism. They're generalists, so they've got their limitations. But um, just thinking of particular catastrophes, there's, there's a, a, a journo now retired who worked at News Radio for uh, more than a decade, Bud Eastley, very experienced man. And he was at his best when you had something like the Queensland floods. Because you'd, what happens when you've got something like that is you've got a mass of information. You've got to bring it down to a, a limited... Uh, uh, in, in terms of radio, a limited number of minutes, and uh, you've got to keep it uh, in an orderly fashion. And uh, 
it sounds like a, a reasonably easy task when you say it, when you say it in those terms. You just got to you know find out what's going on, tell people what's going on. In fact, it's immensely confusing confusing when uh, when you're reporting something. It's very important you get it right if you, and particularly in terms of a catastrophe again like the Queensland flood, that um, if you are telling people not only what has happened but what might happen. Um, any inaccuracy can uh, be, well, it can be a matter of life and death at its most dramatic or melodramatic, but uh, it's, it's critical. And um, journos, flawed though they are, are about the best mechanism I've come across, a fairly self-serving um, conclusion <laughs> to come to after a lifetime in journalism. But uh, uh, I was nearly tempted to say you would say that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. What about you, Neil? Um, what's... Uh, what's been your uh, journalistic uh, history? Uh, well, I guess I started uh, long enough ago that when I was at university we had typewriters and one computer to go around uh, all the students. Um, uh, got a gig as a copy boy at the Daily Sun, if okay. anyone remembers that when it kicked off here. <coughs> then did a cadetship at the Telegraph. So when afternoon news was still a very popular format. Um, during that period, News Limited came in, took over the, the Telegraph. Uh, I've worked on and off. Um, I've been overseas. But basically, my career has been with News Limited. So uh, Sunday Mail, Courier Mail, and in most recent years, I was Chief of Staff at the Courier Mail. That's right. And then I uh, uh, kicked off MX, the afternoon free paper in Brisbane, commuter paper. And then the last 18 months, two years, I've been at Quest Community Newspapers, which is... Um, a, world a whole apart. new world. Absolutely. Mm. Um, so that's a pretty diverse, but all in the print media. It's a long print media experience for you then, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. Mm. Um, but you know, it, it, it's amazing to see how it's evolved from the old teletext coming through where, apart from radio, we were the, really the only news source during the day because mm. there were no breaking news bulletins on TV. It was just a completely different beast mm. uh, to now when it's news non-stop all the time. So in an era of um, iPhones and iPads, um, newsprint sort of looks on the face of it um, pretty pedestrian, but its technology has actually changed a lot, hasn't it? Yeah, it sure has. Um, <coughs> we like to think of ourselves now as not just a newspaper, but a digital presence as well. So it's the same, or even better, news that we're getting out there. It's just on a different format, um, whether it be newsprint, which is still, you know, um, still incredibly popular. Mm. Certainly with Quest, we've just opened two new papers. So mm. demand is still there for newspapers, and we see, see that as being you know, a long-running uh, thing for us, which is terrific. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right, yeah, and which we do. And um, we find, you know, the bulk of our audience still love reading the paper in the afternoon but or in the evenings, but if you can get to them during the day as well by a variety of sources, mm. all the better. Well, let's, uh, let's start to sort of launch into this area of uh, catastrophes and disasters and how the media deals with it and what the differences might be in the way that electronic media uh, covers it. Uh, what are the disciplines and the angles that the electronic media uh, would might focus on that would be perhaps different in the way that the print media would have to deal with it? Yeah, well, the the, uh, the obvious central difference is deadlines, although that, that's been blurred now. I mean, notionally, you've got a weekly deadline, Neil, but you don't because you've got a, a digital mm -hmm. presence which uh, updates all the time. Uh, news radio is 24 hours a day, so there's no deadline. It's just completely completely uh, rolling all the time. So it's, uh, it's the, the, the major difficulty if you're dealing with a catastrophe is to uh, stay up to date with it minute by minute and to keep it, uh, keep it accurate, uh, you, you know, first with the news, first with the correction as opposed to some organisations <laughs> is not really the ABC's <laughs> aim. Uh, so you want to you get it first, but you want to get it right. And, and that's more critical, or it's more obviously critical in a minute t by minute, 24 hour either TV or radio uh, um, circumstance. Um, but uh, yeah, even the luxurious world of weekly deadlines, they're not really weekly deadlines anymore. No, it's all gone. Um, and I guess the, the key example this year is the floods where we were just operating non-stop. And in fact, you know, um, we managed to get our papers out uh, just in time. And uh, we then spent the next three days in conjunction with the Courier Mail, uh, basically helping feed stuff to their website, our website, Twitter mm. feeds, collating it all. Mm. Um, because we saw our major role then as just getting the information out mm. as quickly as we could and correcting if needs be. Because 
in those situations, there is a lot of wrong information going out there, particularly on Twitter, you know, mm -hmm. just going, going berserk. So it was very much a vital, I guess, communication funnel. We need to get the appropriate information to as many people as we could, as quickly as we could. Yeah. And, so and in terms of the topic we're dealing with today, that's, that, that seems to me to, to underline the, the need for, for journalists there, because there is a, an explosion of, of uh, well, not, not necessarily information, um, facts, maybe, maybe facts, maybe not facts, but there's an explosion of material, and uh, you, you can't simply say Twitter says something. You've got to, you've got to have some understanding of where it comes from. And, and as a member of the public, it, it, it helps to, to know that the ABC is saying something and that that means something, or we hope it helps, rather than uh, I heard it on um, um, somebody wrote on the web or somebody tweeted. Uh, it's, uh, it's more immediate. All of this information, all of this material, is uh, immediately available, but it's not immediately intelligible and it's not immediately reliable. So just in terms of the topic that we're discussing today, again, I come back to journos as the uh, fairly flawed but necessary filter in terms of saying chaff wheat, chaff wheat. So there are a number of elements really to the, the discipline, aren't there? First is the capacity to take a mass of information mm. and distill the key issues, mm. uh, the key information that's important. Secondly, uh, the capacity to communicate that in a way that people can understand. Uh, so you've got to be able to deliver it in absorbable uh, chunks. Um, and thirdly, to have some sense of authoritativeness mm. about it, rather than mm. just being, you know, mm. information flow that's meaningless or inaccurate. Yeah, and inescapably, you're dealing with um, areas you don't know about. If it's a natural catastrophe, mm. you know, one of the most important things on radio is to actually pronounce the town's name correctly, because <laughs> <the> people aren't really <laughs> going to believe you if you uh, say Innsvale or something. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, and and it's 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 a it's a very difficult thing to just keep things happening at a sufficient pace, and you're looking at your competitors and how fast they're reporting things, and and to not sacrifice accuracy in the need for uh, for being first with with material. It's. Uh, it's a reasonable discipline, and, it's, and it comes with experience. It's, uh, it, I don't know, in experience is an indefinable quality that just allows you to, to know what's important more readily than when you started off. Mm. Yeah, I, I think in the, in the community space that we're inhabiting now, we're finding increasingly that um, what people define as news in the community space is different to what they're getting out of metro newspapers and radio and television. And I guess it's because we're at that coalface we are out there in the community all the time and they're telling us what they like to read and what they want out of their newspapers and at the same time they're not afraid to ring up and tell us when we've got it wrong. Mm. So we're really having to redefine that and uh, really mm. work out what it is that, that makes people embrace us. And it, it's, it's different, I'm finding it very different from, from working in that metro space. So um, it's that whole sense of don't just give me a problem, I'm sick of the problems, I want the solutions. Mm. Don't tell me I'm living in a bad place. <coughs> you know, I want you to have uh, pride in my community. So we, uh, and but that it goes across different facets of the paper. So we're having to redefine that all the time. Yeah, the, the sort of small p politics is much more local, isn't mm, it? In, very the, much in so. the community newspapers. Yeah. So hyper local was the term yeah, we were using. Yeah, very very hyper local. So it's interesting though that you said that in the context of the floods in Brisbane, um, whereas most of the time your focus would be quite distinct from the metro. Uh, media approach, you actually became much more integrated um, in the the web of uh, delivering that information. Yeah, uh, we. We'll, 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 I'll come and we'll get everyone involved in a minute because we need mics. We're on uh, vodcast. All right, we'll, we'll get a mic to. Uh, Get you, in, get you more involved in yeah. it, just a sec. Yeah, I like the idea because, you know, we, we found that if, if our main role in a disaster is to get information to people, yeah. and we've only published once a week in the paper, and um, we don't have as many people following us online as the Courier Mail, how do we get the information out? Our role is to get the correct information out to people so they can make the right decisions to make sure their families are safe, their possessions are safe, and they can get out of the way of any any other problems that are, that are looming. So we just said, let's cooperate. Let's just uh, dedicate you know, our 100 reporters to combine with the Courier Mail's 100 or so reporters. Immediately, you're getting yeah. twice as much information out. Yeah. Yeah, so does, that, got a does, that capture, does that capture what both of you 
saw as your core role during that sort of heightened um, period of uh, you know intense work that is getting the information out is yeah that? yeah I, I guess that's the central task but it's multi-layered in the <coughs> ABC because you've got local ABC <coughs> and you've got uh, you know, various arms of the ABC we're in a national news network so we're going to give you a lot of the news but we're not going to be as intensely local as uh, as uh, as the the, uh, the Brisbane uh, local radio would be. We're not going to be devoting the same amount of time to it because there's a national audience, and you've got to make judgments about what's of interest to the national audience. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, that's a huge national story. Uh, so uh, we were covering it extensively, but uh, you you cover it being aware that uh, that uh, local radio is also covering it, and it's interesting in terms of the role of journalists. Uh, play in a in a catastrophe such as that. There's a lot that goes on without journos that works really well. Talkback radio has been long established with people just swapping information, and Twitter, particularly, uh, I remember in the Christchurch uh, earthquake, that people were actually using Twitter to directly uh, connect with each other and to to have a semi-public or an entirely public forum, saying, "Please give me information about one person." So there's many other layers of, uh, of uh, information flying around. And it's quite a discipline on journalists that, uh, that people are, have access to a lot of material that doesn't go via you. So they've got uh, grounds for assessing your, your own performance in terms of the, the information you're giving out f from uh, material independent of you. So it keeps you honest because there's a lot of people sending out a lot of information. And if you don't know what you need to know, others will be aware of it. Uh, I think also um, where perhaps we differ from radio and Twitter and other sources is that uh, from day one we were thinking how do we help in the repair process because we know that it's coming, we know we, it goes beyond just covering what's happening this week um, and we, we have to map it out and within a week you know, we had a, uh, the whole year mapped out on things we're going to roll out this weekend for example we're taking photographs for victims who lost family portraits because we figured we've got photographers, people lost their photo albums, let's go out and, mm, and do something on. like that. Yeah. So, um, but there's been a lot of that and a lot of other people have done it, but um, we want to make sure that we play, we're part of the community and we, we go beyond just reporting the news. We, we go beyond, har we, we, get, we go into that field where we're harnessing communities to help other communities, basically. Mm. Yeah, and we've so got a slightly more distant perspective as a, a national network that, uh, we, you know, the, the local radio particularly is part of the community and we're on your side. And because we're news and national, it's a more dispassionate, here's the information approach. Mm. So we're moving into the sort of, uh, we've described the way it works, but now we're moving into the sort of values area. Mm. Um, is there an ethic around dealing with this? I mean, in the context of uh, our topic, prepared or panicked, mm. um, Obviously, if the media get it wrong, then, uh, as you mentioned, Marius, uh, that could be uh, the you know, life or death type uh, effects. Yeah, yeah there's, so there's what's, what's the ethic that the, the media Well, has? the ABC ethic is, is that we are a, a non-commercial national broadcaster with big responsibilities, and our responsibilities are not to simply maximise our audience. Our responsibilities are not to simply engage the emotions of our audience. Our responsibilities are to to provide um, as much information as we can and to be as useful as we can, uh, but not to be you know, deeply involved. Although you see, you see some uh, ABC stories, TV news stories, where you, you, you do, you, you've got to cover the personal as well as the sort of you know, statistical circumstance of a flood or whatever. But um, we, <coughs> are, we are not looking for hot button issues and as an end in itself. But we don't. Uh, we don't also want to be simply uh, uh, cold-hearted about uh, reporting circumstances that, that have this huge impact on individual lives. So, you know, you you you, you know, the, the ABC Journal needs to be there and um, and getting the information and giving a sense of the impact uh, on individuals. But they don't have to be sneaking in and doing a, a death knock as as I did in my early days of uh, journalism to try and talk the family into giving you a photo or something like that. So mm. it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, I don't know whether ethic, it's, you know, we, we've got different market forces on us. We don't have market forces on us. We have audience forces on us and it produces a different product and, uh, and that's a reasonable thing. It's a thin line between human interest and voyeurism, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and happily, in our newsrooms, journos aren't going to be bagged for, for 
not getting that photo or not getting that shot of the tear, tearful person. You know, that's not such a high priority. Um, yeah, I think from, <coughs> from our point of view, obviously we are a commercial organisation, but in times of disaster, um, and certainly during the floods, look, I can't speak for the Courier Mail, um, but I think you'll find that... <laughs> yeah, There's a I'm not going there. <laughs> um, but I think you'll find, you know, the difficulties with printing the papers, distributing the papers... Logistics um, the fact are different. That, yeah, no one's advertising because they're all running around mm. trying to fix up the, their businesses. Uh, you know, commercially, it's there's nothing to be derived for us. So it becomes, uh, what are we there for? Mm. And our core role is still helping and communicating. Yeah. Um, and that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. But you can see the different pressures acting on the ABC because it, you know, I think the ABC is not as good at doing the theatre of um, journalism uh, or reporting of natural catastrophes. I don't know that the ABC is by and large as good as the commercials, but there's, there's a... a a bonus on the other side that the ABC will give you, um, a, you know, th there's no pressure to beat up a story on the ABC. I remember when I was on the Telegraph uh, uh, decades ago, uh, there was a flood of no great uh, proportions in um, somewhere in New South Wales, I've now forgotten, and I was working with a photographer who was a creative bloke and he said, you know, this is pretty dull, listen, uh, little kid, can you go stand in the floodwaters, would you? And I still didn't look at him, he said, look, kneel down. <laughs> And, uh, Make it look deeper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, at the Daily Telegraph, when you went back to the chief of staff, that they were going to be putting in particular measures. We want drama, mm. and if it's not that dramatic, you know, you've got to create it a bit. Mm. At the ABC, you don't have to create drama. You shouldn't miss it if it's there, mm. but you don't have to create it. So, what do you think? Um, here's your opportunity to uh, gain further insights into, or indeed, just comment on how you think the media covered uh, the recent. Uh, floods and cyclones in Queensland. Uh, were there aspects of the way they did their job that you thought should have been done better? Or um, were there things that weren't done that you think the media should be doing in those sorts of situations? We'll kick off here. <coughs> Hi, guys. Uh, my name's Luke Hayes. Um, I think the media really was really repetitive in what they showed on the on the national news, uh, all of the news programs really, it was almost off-putting uh, at, at by the time we got onto a new topic, um, the rep yeah, just the repetitiveness of it. Um, and people, because of that, were then, like I lived in Caboolture, <coughs> and uh, more than 14,000 people joined a Facebook uh, page for the Caboolture floods um, to find out about road closures, uh, the mass evacuation texts that created panic in the region um, because there was no information to back up those texts. Um, from that date, I started building a disaster recovery framework plan um, of which I was interviewed at Caboolture uh, Quest newspapers on Monday for an article. Um, the framework's almost complete and now I'm in the process of looking for funding for it to cover from the Lockyer Valley up to the Moreton Bay local council region. and my estimates for establishment would be about half a million dollars and take six to 12 months to establish a directory of services that would collate all the information that you would need from, say, Queensland Police, Bureau of Meteorology, roads, all that sort of information that people were looking for. Bring, connect all of those websites to one directory, include with it community services, health services, uh, and tradesmen services so that you've got access to all the information when you need to rebuild, when you need to plan, when you've uh, and then stage two of the business is to um, expand into free training so that we can, uh, any people that volunteer and want to learn about CPR, first aid, rescue skills, all those sort of things can then, um, in stages as we build income through the organisation, because it is a profitable business as I've designed it, um, we can provide free training for these people um, to be prepared for next time. So we have the information available and more of the community has the knowledge to uh, prevent the, m the massive uh, waste of uh, our property and um, the waste of life that happened last time. We can minimise that by collaborating together through a directory of services like I've just mentioned. Good on you, Luke. Yeah, There's an initiative you. that came out of it. Yeah, um, <coughs> can't really comment on that, but I think it's a great idea and certainly we did have major problems in Caboolture. There was a distinct lack of information and as you say, that panic was being caused and people couldn't find out what was going on. 
In terms of the repetitive nature um, of news, I haven't worked in television, but something that we continually find is that you have to hammer a message or get, communicate over and over again. We found just days um, after the, the floodwaters had started subsiding in Milton, and there was a, you know, a woman at a bus stop waiting for a bus to come along. Um, didn't know what was going on. Hadn't heard anything. Uh, you know, it was you know, it was really quite distressing. You know, the, she hadn't got the message. Obviously, hadn't listened to radio. Hadn't watched television. Hadn't seen the newspaper. Um, and there, there are numerous examples of that throughout the floods that people were missing the message. And I think it's important. Right, if you're watching it over and over, it becomes repetitive. But it has to be done so that people are getting the information they need. It doesn't. They the people have to be educated before the next disaster happens so that they know what to do, where to look and where to go. Yeah, what what really the protocols journal. that yeah. should be happening to minimise the effect of the damage. Yeah. That's sort of going beyond journalism. It's, a, it's true that, you know, that you've got to prepare for disasters. It's not a journalist's role. And, uh, and the first part of your Facebook site, I think you said you were providing... providing oh, it, wasn't, it wasn't mine. I, s yeah. I joined it, but I, right. I didn't start well, that look, one. Yeah, if sites are providing information and they've got the same task as, as any journalist, is the information correct? Know, that's that's the difficulty. It's uh, yeah. you know that's that's where I suggest with my directory connecting to the reliable resources like the newspapers, the government agencies, um, and the not-for-profit mm. organisations that have access to that high-quality information mm. in real time, and then through a link to our website, can mm. people can get anywhere or whatever they require at the time. Yeah. And on repetition, that's true of any story, any big story. Everyone's aware that uh, you know Osama bin Laden gets killed. People get sick of hearing that after after a few days. And any politician knows that any terrible story, it's uh, if you can survive ten days, you can survive because it's mm -hmm. going to fade. The point Neil's making though is that if you hear it the first time, uh, then you're going to be driven mad by the number of extra times you hear it. Mm. But Sometimes there are a whole lot of people out there who don't hear it till it's said the tenth time mm. <laughs> because they missed the first nine. Mm. Uh, and so it takes a multiple uh, repetition of it uh, sometimes in the just the general media yeah. uh, for everyone to actually get the penetration. Yeah, yeah, we, we have uh, <coughs> news bulletins uh, twice an hour, but we don't work on the assumption you heard the previous one. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. I understand that, but should, not, should the media not be planning uh, from what we've learnt out of this recent disasters over the last year and the start of this year, and start planning. Good to, question. So, um, planning what do you think for the future from what, what think, we've learnt? What do you think might be some lessons in how uh, the media deals with this? Uh, were there any lessons, like uh, things that occurred to you in the course of or at the end of it, where you sort of thought, "Oh well, we could have done this or we could have done that." Uh, yeah, yeah. After any big story, people are, people are going to be um, reviewing uh, how how the how you perform during the story, and usually it's just a, a welter of self congratulations, <laughs> 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 and then you move on. But uh, but you do you do learn and um, I, I'm I I wasn't directly involved in the Queensland uh, flood coverage myself, but uh, ABC TV in particular was having plenty of post mortems about that. Mm. And I I, uh, I, I n not in terms of God we got it wrong or anything like that, but a just sensible review of uh, how you deal with it. And that was just there was just a string of catastrophes right from uh, uh, from Christmas on, mm. and it was really stretching uh, the resources of the organisation. So. Uh, in, at one level, you can have a review and decide we're going to throw more resources at it. But if you have a sequence of events like that, uh, you know, you're just running from Queensland to Christchurch to all over the place. Mm -hmm. I imagine that in the organisations, as indeed in the community, the adrenaline uh, that was running at the height of those events brought a lot of goodwill, brought, brought people together. Yeah. There's a fair bit of letdown now, isn't there? And, um, you know, even Anna Bly is starting to experience that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't know. I think that's an that's an inevitable emotional arc. Yeah, I think there is right. a huge effort by everyone concerned, huge concern, and uh, and then you you're left with an unnewsworthy mess, mm. and you've got it on your own, and and that's a that's a reasonable feeling for the community. You, you saw that with the mud army. You know, everyone mm. Mm. in the days immediate days immediately following, everyone was out there helping, and mm. it was you know it was terrific to see. It made you feel really good, but then that faded away, and Volunteers Queensland are really struggling to get volunteers now, mm. and yet there's still a lot of work to be done. Mm. And there are people who, like everyone's drifting into sort of a semi-depression now, of yeah. those who are still yeah. suffering, of course, yeah. and are able yeah. to rebuild. But we're in the news business, we're not in the compassion business, and the news spotlight is just cruel like that, it just moves on. True. Yes? Um, I, I Mike's coming. <coughs> Talking about before, um, we were just wondering 
if there was anything um, that you could discuss around the information that uh, the community wanted during the crisis and what you could get your hands on and if you found that there was a, a disparency or whether there was key issues that came up within the community or um, any feedback mm. that you got, that would kind of, you go, I wish, you know, that were there those questions yeah. that you couldn't uh, answer? Yeah. Um, there probably were. I can't recall any. Uh, certainly... Uh, what we found, and this also goes to the way we've looked at how we restructure the way we get news out, and one of the things was it started building up as the floodwaters started rising, and it was to do with um, sandbags, where do you get sandbags? And we were getting that question, we were thinking, how do we get the information out? So we had our Twitter account, and so we started putting it out through Twitter when we'd have reporters going to each of the locations, how long's the queue, uh, what's getting on there. In fact, most of our guys ended up filling sandbags, um, but they w we could get that news out. So if you were following us on Twitter, and then that was the other hard part, how do you get the message out that we're on Twitter? Mm. But if you could follow us on Twitter, you were getting that information. And then that really helped once the crisis hit, because there were many people who didn't, uh, no newspapers, didn't have power, so couldn't get, mm. um, uh, unless they had a battery radio, mm. uh, a lot of people Great were using- Great thing radio. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> terrific. <laughs> Um, they were using their mobile phones because they were charged up. So mm. they were able to get the twi Twitter messages. So they were starting to get information and it would be uh, things like, uh, you know, we've just seen this dog and they would describe the dog. Um, mm. Does anyone know who belongs to the dog? Because yeah. it's little stuff like that that they want to help with. Um, road closures. You know, this road is now closed. Mm. Um, the water's now at this level. Stuff that was happening immediately. And mm. just to get that instant feed was quite phenomenal. Yeah, well, it's fantastic, all these new tools for this micro-reporting, and you hope it's accurate, uh, but uh, it's not in a, in a national newsroom, that's not what we're involved in. The ABC is hugely involved with it, and as I said, it's multi-layered uh, construction, and local <coughs> radio does a lot locally, but uh, in a national newsroom, you, you, you're, uh, you've got to make sure you've got the big picture reported in your bulletins, and then you try and drill down a bit by just ringing in locally and, uh, and uh, getting some immediate voices on what's happening. Mm. Yeah. During the, the floods, the Queensland Police Service had a, was very active um, in both Facebook and Twitter. Yeah. And I know that um, they actually cut back the amount of media releases they were doing. So where previously they would have done multiple media releases every day, you know, every day, they just did one release a day because they were pushing out information immediately. And I just wondered um, how that affected your end of things if um, you, know, you felt that you were under pressure to, to respond as quickly as they were or that you felt they were filling a need, a, a gap that um, that you would have covered previously? Yeah, yeah. certainly from, from our point of view, we thought it was fantastic because um, traditionally it can be quite hard to get information out of the police for obvious reasons. Um, so <laughs> uh, for them to actually be firing it off and getting it out there, and we were just using Twitter to spread it or get it up online, um, it, was, it made a big difference to us. We thought it was terrific. Yeah, I, I wasn't involved directly in, in that, that dissemination of information on the Queensland floods, but uh, as a general rule, the police are a pretty cumbersome unit to deal with. The, their, their instinct is to say as little as possible in unintelligible terms, but, um, uh, but they're, they're, I, I don't know, I was about to say they're better than they used to be. I don't know that they are. I think they're, they're, they're pretty much where they always were, uh, but they err on the side of um, not imperiling they're, they're interested in dealing with the crime, and a secondary thing is to uh, is to deal with the public, although there's a lot more PR awareness and lots of people are hired for that. Uh, but um, in 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 the, the case of the Queensland floods, you could see from a distance that, uh, that there was a very efficient flow of information, so the police are to be commended for that. Yeah, I, I think one of the good things they did do on their Twitter feed, I think it was the police, uh, had the myth busters. So... It <coughs> oh, yeah. And that's the problem with Twitter. <coughs> it doesn't take long for uh, one small fact to be wrong and it just gets spread mm. so fast. Mm. And they were acting on that really quickly and just saying, no, it's not true and, and getting the, the facts out there as quickly as possible, which was terrific. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we never get it as quickly as we want, that's for sure. Um, we won it yesterday. And uh, look, I don't think we had any complaints. I think it was the case that everyone knew that there was a common cause here, that we were getting, trying to get the information out um, as timely as possible. And from our end, certainly, we, we had no trouble. Yeah, those, those organisations, uh, and some, it varies from organisation to organisation. Um, like in terms of, um, look, I, I wasn't covering the, the Queensland floods directly, but just looking at catastrophes generally in, in the Rwandan situation or something like that, or if you get, went to natural disasters when I was covering Africa, um, the NGOs, the, the first people on the ground for the non-government organisations that, that um, rely on public donations, the first person on the ground was the media person. And they were immediately available to tell you exactly what they were doing, although there was no one else there to do it. So uh, <laughs> they're, they're pretty cluey about their, their public relations. Um, the Red Cross is very, is, is very adept at uh, public relations. I don't mean that uh, unkindly. It's, uh, it, it's important for the Red Cross to get the message out that it's, it's involved. If you need to know what's happening with um, Tim Costello's organisation, what's that? Um, uh, yeah. Care in Australia. Care, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tim Costello will tell you day or night, any time. And, and quite rightly too, they, they, you know, people don't know what they're doing <coughs> and they only hear, um, mostly they hear when something is of, of, of a severity to be in a news bulletin, so uh, they get the, the message out. But uh, there are some very skilled PR operatives in those organisations and there are less skilled and uh, government departments, I mean government departments are a bit of a nightmare, the ministerial officers tend to be much clearer about um, dealing with uh, the media. Mm. There was one over here I think. Uh Someone had a question? Comment, please. <coughs> Hi, um, I come from Ipswich. Um, out our way, the integration between the media and the council was absolutely brilliant. Um, between Q the QT, River 949, our mayor, who loves everyone in Ipswich. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they really used and Facebook. Loves him. <laughs> oh, we all love them. Um, re really used Facebook very well and put out a lot of. Um, really critical information and one of the really simple things that the QT put out was um, a link uh, <coughs> in their paper to the flood level gauge that we actually have in Ipswich. So rather than people in the area being incredibly panicked, what we were finding was um, uh, in amongst my community of friends in Ipswich, I was one of the people that could see elevation on um, Google Earth and I had people Facebooking me going, what's my elevation? <laughs> and then comparing it with the flood level height. And we could actually watch the flood level as it came up, um, which meant that we could prepare in a much better way. We weren't panicked thinking, oh, my God, where's it going to get to? You know, if it gets to the house down the street, what, you know, we worked out, okay, we're four metres above the previous flood level, so, you know, we won't need to do anything unless this happens. And we had friends at different levels doing the same thing. Um, what I was wondering is, um, it, how do you walk that fine line when you know that something is coming up, um, that there is going to be an event of some kind, whether it's a cyclone or a flood or whatever, how do you walk that fine line between, okay, this is coming, you need to prepare, and, oh, my God, we're all going to die. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, because yeah, you can, you know, the media can sort of go either way. Yeah, yeah. And I was, you know, I was thinking that must be a very hard balance to find. It is particularly um, depending on whether you've got people on the ground or not who can tell you uh, for themselves. Certainly, uh, your your mayor Paul Pasali, you know, went on television that morning and and told people to panic. So uh, that makes it really awkward mm -hmm. because you get saying, "What information are we getting here?" Um, that the mayor of the city is saying people should panic. Your your immediate reaction is, "That's probably not the case," but you need to then assess not only what the mayor has said, but what you're also getting from, well, hopefully from people on the ground, but also from the police and emergency services, because you just don't want to go out there and, you know, maybe he was getting a bit you know, buoyed by the occasion, so to speak. Um, and you, you just don't want to go out there and broadcast that if it's not true, or if he's just, you know, or... <coughs> he or was, trying he to was, jolt yeah, people out yeah, of complacency, maybe. he was trying to raise maybe. awareness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, he was trying to do his thing, but, you know, if you went out there and put it across the website, panic... Yeah, that's yeah. not the thing to do. No. And that's what good journalism should do. It should be able to weigh up um, exactly who's saying what, who, who's reliable, 
and, and is anything contradictory being said by any other source? Is that reliable? I think it's, it's terrific if you've got that sort of information about, you know, you're at elevation X and it's only coming to, you know, three metres short of that, so you're laughing. As long as you've got it right, because if you've got it wrong, it's fairly, fairly serious consequences. And um, I mean, journalism certainly doesn't have a monopoly on reliable information and uh, there is pressure on journalists to make stories as interesting as humanly possible and that pressure can, can cause you to pull out the dramatic quote as the headline <coughs> and, um, and, and you, you've, got to, you've got to make you know, fairly cool, detached judgments, ideally, and, um, and not just get a hothead about uh, what sounds like an exciting way to start to, to lead the 12.30 bulletin. It's, uh, um, and journalism is um, subject to those pressures and susceptible to those pressures and gives in to those pressures, but um, ideally they don't. Mm. Yeah. There was uh, one particular example during the floods where I, I found the media was very irresponsible. And I should just start by saying that I'm a hydraulic engineer myself, so it's my field of expertise. And I think it was one of the breakfast shows in uh, I don't know, Sunrise that um, showed some, some rough flood modelling with the predicted flood heights. Oh, and yeah. they said, OK, you know, if the water gets to, to five metres in town, here's the extent to which it's deep. But then they showed a second one where they <coughs> said, if the water gets to seven metres, it'll look like this. And at no point were the flood levels ever predicted to be seven metres. Mm. It was completely wrong. <laughs> and when they said, even as they showed the extent, they said, now there's no prediction of seven metres, but if it happened, it would look like this. <laughs> and <laughs> I really feel <laughs> that it was such sensationalist journalism, and that definitely crossed the line in my mind, where they were deliberately you know, trying to panic people and and not just prepare them. Yeah, well, that is a pressure on, particularly on, uh, on commercial journalists, that happily for the ABC journalist is not on them, because you don't, you don't get great <laughs> kudos for, for sensationalism. <coughs> you don't get great kudos if you, f if you miss the story either, or if you're late and things like that, that the ABC can be accused of at times, but uh, there's not great pressure on it. But I reckon you've raised another point there, that uh, you were particularly irritated because you knew what you were talking about. Journalists are generalists, and they're working under a lot of time pressure. And they, they have not 1% of a hydraulic engineer's understanding. And if they get a dramatic picture, there's a certain amount of pressure to put a dramatic picture out there, no matter how fanciful. And you should, you should be responsible enough to fight that. But, um, but journos are going to be talking about hydraulic engineering one minute, you know, the Middle East complexities the next minute, and uh, uh, a crime story after that. They can't possibly know that much about it. And if you have... You know, any time I've been personally involved in a story, which is very rare that you, you know all about a story, journals, th there's never a story goes out that doesn't have a mistake in it. You know, it's just a, a human failing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Um, I, th I think in, in that example, uh, I think they then run the risk. If they're going to go and put it on air um, and they are going to sensationalise things, uh, they run the risk that it's going to damage their reputation, as it has done here. Um, and they run the risk that that's going to spread. So it's always a, a risk they take if they're going to ramp it up too far. They're just banking there aren't too many hy hydraulic engineers <laughs> watching at this point. <laughs> were, there <laughs> <laughs> were there any other instances that uh, either of you um, noticed? Because, you know, part of your, I suppose, <coughs> what happens in your life, because you are actively engaged in the profession of journalism, you notice how other journalists do things mm. from time to time and every now and then something will stand out. Were there instances that you can recall where there was a standout uh, reporting that you thought, oh, gee, that's a bit ridiculous? Just a beat up. Mm. Yeah. A beat up um, or, look, or look, just... There's um, so many, none spring to mind. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, Neil, can you think of no, a good, good like example? Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's just a routine part of our industry. Or you can watch Media Watch every Monday night. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not so yeah. much the beat up, but just things that you thought, gee, why did they? Why did the journalist deal with it like that? It's just not relevant, or it's you know, it's um, it's off off point. You know. Mm. Uh, I, I think one of the points, certainly within newspapers, is the number of hands something goes through. Yeah. Uh, so a story starts with a reporter. In this case, they might be out in the field, so uh, they might be phoning it through, tapping something through on their phone. Suddenly there's another part of the story from another reporter that they're not aware of, but someone in the office goes, okay, well, that fits with that. Yeah, so it could and, get mangled. And it can get mangled, mm. not intentionally, but mm. um, 
you go through all the proper processes, but at the end of the day, we're all human, and mm. there are so many people involved. Someone else does the headline as mm. opposed to the person yeah, crafting some, the some, story. Sometimes they do the headline before they get the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Up here. coughs> Hi. Uh, it's interesting to consider that uh, a lot of the time after the event, we can say that something was sensationalized, but outliers do happen from time to time. I mean, sometimes something can come completely out of the blue and actually you know, be an even bigger disaster than we expected. And in those cases, we'll just simply say that the journalists didn't go far enough. Isn't it uh, where we're drawing the line between you know, prepared and panicked is sort of to do with just probability? 2020 hindsight mm. vision. Yeah. I don't think <laughs> understatement's the biggest issue facing journalism. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there's a professional <laughs> tendency to go the other way. Um, yeah, I... But, but certainly, I mean, if, if, uh, uh, if you go back to the tsunami that uh, hit uh, uh, Southeast Asia, the, the, the enormity of it wasn't apparent immediately. It's not particularly <coughs> a mistake, it's just uh, that, well, there it was the fact that the, the areas that had been hit were just out of communication. Yes. So, uh, um, uh, but, but assessing the importance of a story is a very difficult thing. I mean, I, I get into work every morning at 4.30, and try and figure out what's important in politics every morning and guess where the stories are going to go and guess which is most important. And I'm near infallible, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> After, you know, by, by mid-morning, things look different. By then, you've figured out the question you should have asked at 5 a.m. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a rolling process, and it's, uh, it's, it's endless and imperfect. So let's uh, move then to your point uh, off the Australian stage and look at these big international events. Mm. The tsunamis in Southeast Asia, mm. uh, the uh, events in uh, Japan, of course, um, Hurricane Katrina, um, the um, the issue around the volcano emissions over Europe that uh, grounded airlines for days on end, weeks mm. on end. Um, is the media, the the Australian media way of dealing with those issues different, and in what way? to dealing with local events? Well, there's media and media, and there's, there's sort <coughs> of a dark calculus on subs benches that, you know, one Australian equals about, you know, 100 uh, Brits and about 1,000 Bangladeshis and things like that. You need to explain the subs. Sub-editors who are de yeah. determining uh, the prominence that stories are given in uh, newspapers and how they're presented. Mm. Um, the, but the fact is that, that, that all people everywhere are much more interested in, in local issues, so uh, there is a, a receding interest the more distant it is. The f and the, the first question that Australians ask is, any Australians involved? Mm. I don't, I don't I'd, I'd, you know, maybe in a, a better world we'd be equally concerned for all people everywhere, but I think it's, a, you know, a, a neighbourhood in interest is inescapable and it's reflected in, um, in coverage. And there are different cultures in different, uh, in different newsrooms. SBS has, a, has a, a deliberate global focus. The ABC has a sort of, you know, we're responsible and we want to tell you about the world as well as the local area. Uh, commercial TV bulletins are much more local. That's um, one, one of the things I think we have to bear in mind with this too is the number of people we've got on the ground when there's any disaster overseas. So while we can send out hundreds to cover the Brisbane floods, uh, the tsunami in Japan, uh, the tsunami before that in Indonesia, it was all, you know, maybe you've got a team of 10. Mm. Even if you've got that many, and I don't think the Courier Mail had that many at the time. Um, it's such a vast area and so many people have been impacted um, that you just have to highlight, uh, I guess, a slice of mm -hmm. what's going on at any individual time. Mm. It makes it very hard to get uh, the big picture. You draw on the wire services, what are the what the ABC is reporting on radio, on, on television. Uh, you pull all that together. But at any one time, it is very hard to get your hands around the big picture mm. until much later, after the event. Mm. And even uh, when we were covering the tsunami, we found that each night we had to work out how we were going to cover it the next day. And by that I mean you had to get people places when there was very little uh, transport, virtually no communication, and you had to, in a way, second guess where you thought the story was going to be headed the next day so that you could have people in the right positions. Second guessing a story you know, obviously has its pitfalls, but you had to do something rather than just leave people where they were. They have to 
get out and find other elements of the story. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, <coughs> there is a certain narrative to the way you cover um, a, a disaster, uh, and it has to be that way because we don't have enough people to, to do it properly. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, yeah, and the, the people who are there can only see a bit of it. I mean, a, an international story like that is a is partly generated by the Australian reporter who's at the scene and can report on what they're seeing. But it, that, that reporter is also receiving a lot of uh, material back from, from um, head office to tell them what the, the wider picture is, which has to be included in their report. So it's, uh, it's an amalgam of things, and particularly in an in international story, you're, you're not in control of the, of the story by any means yourself. Yeah, let alone the language barrier. Yeah, yeah there's all sorts of logistics. Sorry, I forgot about the microphone again. Um, would that make it? That would make it a hell of a lot easier for the media to disseminate the information. Uh, it'd also make it a lot easier for governments and businesses to organise resources uh, internationally as well as locally. Um, and I really see that as more. Like it's inevitable now that everyone will be connected to the internet at some point in time in the future. It won't just be the advanced nations, it will eventually be the whole planet and we should start looking at it as such um, because the technology is here. The only thing restricting us at the moment from putting this uh, technology globally is intellectual property and the lack of funds in the regions where we, w where we need it. Um, and these are the sort of conversations we need to start tabling in the media, mm. not yeah, just the locally, problem, but The problem is not a dwindling of information, there's an explosion of, of world material. Um, the, the thing is to assess it and, uh, and disseminate it in a coherent way. I think one of the good things that uh, ABC Radio did recently was they uh, uh, used a, a software tool that's available for anyone to use that was developed uh, during the earthquake in Haiti, mm -hmm. which allows people just to map where the danger spots are and <coughs> communicate that from anywhere in the world. So like Ushahidi? Yeah, Ushahidi, exactly. Um, ABC Radio used that during the Brisbane floods, which was terrific. You, know, you could just map the spots and people could get that information out. Yes? I think my question relates to things that have been said before, but uh, are there conditions or criteria that govern the use of the word exclusive? <laughs> 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 um, it probably applies to newspapers <coughs> and television more than radio, that's for sure. Um, yeah, whoever's first gets exclusive on it. If it's exclusive, no, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, generally, uh, you, I don't think too many newspapers use it these days because it's too risky. The Oz yeah. does. The Oz does a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching that. <laughs> <laughs> I was in certainly um, in in television. They use the word exclusive when really they just mean first because it's not exclusive. Everyone's got it. It's just that Channel 10's on at five o'clock and Channel mm. Seven and Nine are on at six. Mm. It's just mm. they just. Very dodgy. No. I was in Sydney this week and the uh, Sydney Daily Telegraph had exclusive branded across the front of their uh, paper in the mornings on a story that was on the news the night before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you can sue them, they'll just use it. <laughs> uh, exclusive is just a sales pitch. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, there was one this week, I think. No the, um, I think uh, <coughs> um, uh, the government. Um, uh, gave, I hate the word leaked because they're just you know selected usually selective government press releases, and um, I, th I think I, uh, I think it was the uh, the figure of forty dollars a ton was going to be recommended to the government, um, and um, uh, Ferguson's office presumably gave that. I think I think it's this story. I uh, gave that both to the Oz and to Fairfax, and they both ran it, but the Oz ran exclusives on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but nobody's going <laughs> to sue. Uh, if they think, you know, the Oz has taken recently to putting, uh, I don't want to bag the Oz exclusively because lots of people do it, <laughs> but, uh, but the Oz has got Thanks a little red <laughs> marker on its, uh, you know, exclusive stories that are just, that scatters it freely across its front page. 
And some stories are exclusive because nobody else is interested, and some stories are genuinely exclusive, and some stories are on the front page of the, of the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age as well. So I wouldn't attach too much importance to it. <laughs> Any other last comments that anyone would like to make? Yes. disaster other than a natural disaster we've been just talking <laughs> exclusively <laughs> about those good question and i just wondered uh, if it applies to other disasters such as natural catastrophes mm. well toss the word terrorism into a story and you, you amplify it by a factor of 100 so uh, mm. that's uh, i mean that's uh, that does tend to introduce an element of the sky falling um, is the methodology the same in terms of getting information out, do you think, or yeah, is it no. different? For is a man-made yeah. disaster? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it varies from man-made disaster to man-made disaster. It's, um, um, uh, if it's war, there's all sorts of specific mm. difficulties in getting to the source of information, and um, you know, the combatants want their side put out, so they'll happily embed you. Um, and, uh, and there are also a lot of pressures in reporting wars that you've got to report our side as our side. And the ABC take, tries to take a much more detached view of reporting, uh, uh, reporting not you know, our boys and girls fighting bravely sort of approach. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think there is a natural tendency for uh, journalists covering a story to maximise the importance of it. And uh, if it's a catastrophe, whether man-made or natural, uh, the sky is falling is a, is a good way to try and sell a story. I, I think the other issue with terrorism too is um, while you want to get the information out there, there are also limits on what you can get out there without putting other people's lives in jeopardy. There, there are obviously government and uh, uh, there are other implications. You know, if it was kidnapping, you really have to be careful what information you're putting out there. We would provide links to all of the current um, government organised terrorist plans and uh, recovery plans and that sort of stuff. So, um, plus also the information coming out of the newspapers and um, other media outlets. But it, any sort of disaster is what I'm trying to include into this uh, design. And people can go to planbig.com.au and look up my recovery for information <laughs> about um, the plan. But what people do now is if planes go into the World Trade Center is they turn on the TV and turn on the radio. That's that's Correct. that's mm -hmm. and the web now I guess. Yeah. yeah. And shoot video of it. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Incredible. <laughs> well thank you for joining us uh, for that uh, interesting conversation. In a world where um, information comes in infinite forms and uh, on infinite topics, um, the life of a journalist is never dull, I can I can imagine. <laughs> and uh, and constant challenges and deadlines and uh, the importance of uh, communicating in ways that uh, uh, people will uh, want to continue to to draw from. Can you join me in thanking our two experts? Marius <laughs> <laughs> and Neil, thank you very much. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Thanks Neil. Yeah.